Welcome everybody to day four of summer camp. Today, we're going to talk about getting the most out of your drum carter. And uh, what we mean by that is we're going to talk about all of the different uh, tools and uh, we'll toss in some tips and tricks and techniques as we go along. Uh, but uh, we're going to talk about how to make sure that the drum carter is doing what you want it to do and uh, make sure that you're preparing fiber in, in the way that you want to. And we're going to talk a little bit about things that make it uh, most uh, efficient as well. Okay. So before we get started, I want to hit a couple of notes here. Uh, this is being recorded. It'll be available later. Uh, the first two recordings I, I just made available on the clemens.com slash summer camp page. Uh, so you can now see Sundays, which was the virtual festival. And you can also see uh, Sunday, no, sorry, Saturday, which was the virtual festival and uh, Sunday, which was our conversation with Maggie Casey. So those are now available. Uh, if you go to clemens.com slash summer camp, scroll on down and there's a link to the YouTube for those right there. Okay. Uh, there are comments. We, we did allow comments so people can talk. Uh, you can talk back and forth with us. I think you can also uh, talk with other people in the comments, but uh, be nice to everybody in the comments. Uh, don't say anything you wouldn't want somebody else to say to you. Uh, it seems kind of silly that we'd have to say that, but that's the, that's the day and age that we live in. Uh, so don't make us uh, boot and ban you if we have to. We really don't want to have to kick anybody out. So be nice out there. Uh, let's see. That takes care of that. I do want to talk about just a couple of our summer camp specials. Uh, and these specials here, uh, this first one I mentioned, we actually started back in, I think it was March or April when we first started realizing that we weren't going to be able to make very many shows this year. Uh, we're doing $5 flat rate shipping on uh, any order under $50, 50 or under, and anything over 50 is free. So a drum carter, blending board, uh, you know, a nice pair of fancy hand cards, anything like that, even just the regular hand cards, those regular wool cards are about 114 these days. So those ship for free as well. So uh, something to keep in mind when you're, you're out there shopping, uh, the price you see on our website, that's what you're going to end up paying. Okay. Uh, we do have a couple specials that are for summer camp week only. So that means they will end uh, this coming Sunday. So something to think about. There is a time limit on those. And that is that we have 30 minutes of free uh, video conferencing and four ounces of good clean fiber with the purchase of any elite convertible. Uh, so if you have a special project that you want to kind of pick our brains about, or you know, you want some help setting your carter up or anything like that, you get 30 minutes of zoom or uh, FaceTime conferencing, whatever works best for you. We'll, we'll make it work uh, with the elite crankless. You get uh, one hour of, FaceTime conferencing. So, I mean, if you want a basically a personalized class, we can set that up and do that. Uh, and that's one-on-one -on -one time with, with just you and us. And you also get eight ounces of good clean fiber for free with the purchase of a crankless. And again, that special runs through the end of this week through Sunday. And with the crankless double wide, which is uh, the double wide version of the carter that I'm going to be using today, uh, you get 16 ounces of good clean fiber as well as the one hour of video conferencing. And I should mention on that double wide drum carter, we have temporarily reduced the price from $4,500 to $39.99. Uh, and since it is more than $50, that comes with free shipping as well. So uh, it's, a, it's a big carter, but we ship it on our dime. Okay. Uh, next on my list here is our code word. Code word of today is bat lifter. So those of you who have been hanging out and checking in just for that, you can... Uh, you can head off now. Uh, I hope most of you are going to stick around for longer than that. I know most of you will. Uh, but today we're going to be giving away a cherry flicker. Okay. So this one's really nice. Uh, it's got a, a nice cherry patina to it. It's going to darken with age a little bit. Um, these are these are really nice. They last a really long time. Great tool. Uh, if you win this, it'd be something where uh, if you already have a flicker, you can keep this one and maybe pass your other one on to uh, somebody else who's learning the craft. You know, share the love. Okay. Quick question there, Maxine. Okay, uh, Maxine says, where are the drawings happening? Maxine, so the way we're doing this is on Saturday, we will post a link to a Google form on the clemens.com slash summer camp page, and you'll enter in the code words there. 
and uh, if you have four or more of the code words, then we'll enter you for the grand prize drawing with the grand pre grand prize draw grand. Ooh, easy for me to say. With the grand prize being a one-year subscription to the Good Clean Fiber Club of your choice, and the code word is Batlifter once again. Okay, and I need to check on this. Give me one second, Maxine. See if I got this right. So. Even for the daily draw, yes, Maxine, that's right. So even even for the daily drawings, uh, those will be entered on Saturday. The the only day of summer camp that that functioned differently was on last Saturday, which was the uh, virtual fiber festival that was run live on Facebook uh, because that was part of the virtual festival. Everything else from Sunday, which was Maggie Casey's, all the way through the end, uh, that's going to be done on. Um, our page on by having you enter that in that form. Okay. And de nada, Maxine. Okay, so I think that covers all of my notes that uh, I wanted to knock off before we got started. Um, and I will just say once again, the code word is Batlifter. Uh, and then all the fleece that we're going to work with today, uh, everything that I will be demonstrating is from Good Clean Fiber. And I can talk about Good Clean Fiber and why we started that uh, once we get going. Uh, but just something to think about if you see me working with some today and you go wow that looks like a really nice fleece uh, Odds are that we do have some of it in stock or something very similar on the website So there you can head to clemens.com slash summer camp and you can uh, see some of that if it's the shave them to save them or if it's the uh, Oregon and Colorado fleece that would be available right on the summer camp page Otherwise you can head to clemens.com slash GCF which stands for good clean fiber and uh, have a whole list of fleeces there. I think there's 60 or 70 fleeces available on the website right now, and they're available in as little as two ounces. So, oh, and always free shipping, I should mention. So uh, with that, let me grab a little bit of fleece. We'll start talking tools and get started. And I'm also gonna switch to the overhead cam. Okay, so that video is spotlighted. Okay, there we go. Can everybody see that? Everybody still hear me? I think we're pretty good. All right, so we're gonna start with simply feeding the drum cart. Okay, we're gonna start really basic here, talking about how to feed the cart. Because I, I really, we have 90 minutes here, so I wanna make sure that we cover everything so uh if you have a question uh please don't feel like it's too basic i, I want to make sure that we really cover just about anything that that you could possibly think of as as far as what you do as far as feeding a drum carter okay or, or anything to do with drum carting so the first thing i'm going to do and this fleece here that i'm working with is uh this is a cvm wensleydale lincoln this is number one two seven this is available on the website and uh, that is a great question why don't I back up and talk to that uh, before we even get started uh, the question is uh, can you review all the parts in the drum carter so that's a really good basic place to start uh, I got my fleece here I've set it down on what we call the infeed tray okay so the infeed tray is whatever part uh, you have there's usually a flat part on just about every drum carter where you're gonna set the fiber and the fiber is then going to be fed into uh, the carter itself. Here we have a, a red safety line. Uh, you'll see a, a lot of uh, carters have this. Some of them don't. Uh, it's, it's a reminder of uh, two things. One, keep your fingers back so that you're not getting too close into the carter itself. And then also you want to be able to see if there's any kind of line like this, especially if, uh, if the color of the line is is really different from the tray itself like you know our our red and our brown is a pretty high contrast here uh, if you've got a color that's a good high contrast it helps to be able to see through your fiber cloud right so if i have a, a cloud of fiber like this and if i throw this whole cloud of fiber at it just like that you see how you can no longer see that safety line right but if i have something like this and let's say that i've taken it to my lock pop and I've opened it up, well, I can still more or less see that red line. You see how you can see that red line right through there? So that, that's that safety line, and I'll talk about that and, 
a little bit more when we get going. Uh, these little triangular blocks here, these are called fiber deflectors. This is what keeps fiber from wrapping around uh, the bearings and wrapping around the shafts. Uh, not all carters have these, even our standard series of carters don't have these. Uh, so you do wanna be careful if you're working on a machine that doesn't have these, that you're staying kind of towards the inside of the carter. And that's something that you're gonna to have to get a feel for. I, I'm not talking about just feed into the center, but don't feed it so that, you know, if you don't have a fiber deflector here, don't feed right up against here because you can tell when you do that, when you see this go straight in, it's gonna wrap right around. But when you do have this fiber deflector, one of the nice things about it is when I feed this in, it's gonna shove it to the inside. And the way we've designed these fiber deflectors is you're still gonna fill up the full width of the carter, okay? Uh, let's talk about drums, right? This is a drum carter. Uh, so this is the liquor in. Okay, this is the in-feed drum. Uh, this one is going to operate uh, backwards, so it's gonna come over the top and towards us. Uh, so liquor in, small drum, in-feed drum, all kinds of things. I tried to stick to liquor in uh, as far as calling it that way, there's not a whole lot of confusion. The larger drum here, this is what we call the swift. Um, not because it runs swiftly. I don't honestly know why it's called that. I'll have to figure that out one day. But you've got the liquor in and the swift. And the swift is going to rotate uh, away from us, okay? While the liquor in is gonna go towards us over the top, this one on the top is gonna go away from us, okay? Uh, we do have a couple of belts here because this is a motorized carter. Uh, so this side is called the idler side. And the reason it's called an idler is that there's a couple of idlers. You can see these, okay, a couple of ball bearing idlers. And you can see this has the figure S, or I'm, yeah, the uh, S shape here. And what that does is that makes sure that the drums rotate in opposite directions. So that's a very basic thing that we actually get a, a lot of calls and emails and messages about is somebody will have a, a belt and uh, they won't get it installed right. Uh, so you need to have some, some sort of configuration, either an S like this, or uh, if it's an older model, a lot of times they'll use a figure eight. Uh, that's how we started uh, with our carters in the 1970s was that figure eight. We still sell those figure eight belts. So you need that because the drums need to move in opposite directions. Okay, so if the drums aren't moving in opposite directions, uh, your carter's not gonna function uh, properly at all. Okay, there's, there's no friction being created and it's just not gonna work right. On the other side of the carter, uh, this is our swift pulley, this is our motor pulley, and this is our motor drive band, okay? Uh, a lot of carters right here, instead of seeing all this, you're gonna have a hand crank, okay? And on this particular model, this one that I'm using, there's even a slide out crumb tray, okay? We call it the debris tray. Uh, technically, it's the debris tray. A lot of people like to poke fun at us and say we got the idea from a toaster. Um, maybe we did, maybe we didn't, I'm not telling you. Uh, so that's pretty basic as far as it goes. I've got the control panel on my front end down here. This has a key. The key is your number one thing for safety, okay? Um, and then the cord. Other than that, I, I think I've pretty much got it all covered. Uh, maybe a couple of just technical terms we should talk about is uh, this, these little black things here, these are your bearings, okay? Uh, so that's what holds the shaft, and the shaft is a metal rod that goes all the way through. And you can see this shaft right here and right here. So this shaft goes all the way through. Uh, that's what is connected to the drums, uh, or I should say the drums are connected to that. And then the bearings kind of hold it all in place and that's how you make your adjustments, okay? And these two here, uh, these screws clamp down the bearings and hold them in place so that you can make adjustments and uh, get the uh, gap that you want between uh, the two drums. And I, I can talk about that as long as we're here right now. Um, the gap between the two sets of drums should be about a business card's thickness. And it's kind of hard to see from here, uh, but I could take a, a business card and slide it down along through here, and it would kind of get stuck on some teeth, uh, but it wouldn't just slide right through, right? Like if I tried to drop it through, it wouldn't fall all the way through or get caught, okay? So about a business card, some people say credit card thickness, uh, just depends on what you're easier to eyeball, right? Uh, and depending upon the size of your credit card or, uh, or your business card. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. If there's any more questions about the Carter itself before we get started, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, uh, we'll jump on into this. And uh, I'm gonna 
peek over here and see if I can see any more questions. Uh, does a standard carter come with any additional tools? Okay, uh, Janica, yeah, the uh, standard carter comes with a flicker and a doffer. And I've got a doffer here, and I'll talk about that when we get to uh, taking the uh, bat off. And then uh, flicker is just like what we're giving away today, except for this one's in cherry, and the carters come with one that's more, uh, it's uh, alder back and a maple handle, so not quite as fancy. And let's see what other questions came in. Uh, I have the, this is from Fran, I have the Elite Convertible, considering upgrading. How much taller is the dump carter with the motor housing and does it affect the ergonomics? Okay, so, uh, great question there, Span, uh, Fran, sorry. Uh, yeah, so the height, I'd have to check for you. I want to say it's about six or, or eight inches that it adds in as far as it's going to bring that up because you are setting that down on, on top uh, and, and it's going to be a frame within a frame, right? So it is going to be a little bit higher. Uh, as far as the ergonomics of it, you, you want to, if the table that you're working on now is, is a comfortable height for you, then yes, you'll want to find a lower table. Uh, you want uh, your workspace to be somewhere where you're comfortable standing all day long. Like I am here, I'm standing shoulder width apart, um, flat footed, uh, so I can move in any direction, especially when we talk about going to uh, electric, working on electric like, like I am, or how you're talking about going from hand crank to electric, there's a little bit of a curve in that, you know, something like a burnishing brush, if you're burnishing and you're just holding it here, but you're hand cranking, right? So you're going to probably, you're going to be holding it with your left hand and hand cranking with your right hand. And if you're doing that on a hand crank, well, if, if your left hand gets a little bit lazy and say, you know, these knuckles come down or you're too far back over, or whatever it is, well, if you happen to catch or just brush your knuckle with the drum and your hand cranking, you're gonna stop. But if you're on uh, an electric carter, right, whether it's the crankless or whether it's a convertible that you've converted to electric drive, the motor doesn't have that same kind of feedback, okay? So when you're on electric, you wanna really stand so that you can, you're comfortable and, and you don't get tired and you can react if you have to, okay? Uh, because you really want to have good form, good posture, and, and make sure that you're doing this where, okay, this is right up at the, you know, kind of the dead center, and I'm not reaching over the carter, and I'm not too close, and, and uh, you know, really a position that's comfortable for you. So I will say, yes, if you are comfortable with the height of the carter now, when you convert it to electric drive, you would want a shorter table. Okay, and other questions. Uh, Beth says, is it an optical illusion? It looks like about a third of an inch between the two drums. Yeah, it, it's a little dark in here, right? So I, I can tell you that, but yeah, it, it's about, Beth, it's, it's just about a drum, or a, I'm sorry, a business card thickness. Uh, so I know it looks a little bit dark in there, just kind of the shadows playing around with it. So I do apologize for that. Uh, Marilyn says, should we ever adjust the distance between the Swift and the liquor in? We set them, Come in here from us um, at about that business card's thickness. And it depends to you on whether or not you want to, I should say it depends on you as to whether or not you want to change that spacing. If the bat that you're making is made in an efficient manner, meaning it's not taking you all day long to make one bat and um, you know, you're getting a really nicely carded product or nicely blended or whatever it is that you're going for, then you can leave that setting there all the time. I can tell you this, the way that we set it, if you're gonna work with just three and four inch long fiber all day long, whether it's semi worsted or woolen, if that's all you're gonna work with ever in your lifetime, you probably never need to adjust it. But if you're feeling adventurous or maybe even a little crazy and you decide you wanna do cotton, or something like that. Well, then you want to adjust these teeth as close as you can. Uh, I'm sorry, adjust the drums as close as you can so that the teeth kind of tick, 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 and then back it off just a little bit so that you can't hear any more ticking, so that you know that you've adjusted them as close as possible. And that's what that's the setting that you would use for something like really short and uh, slippery fibers, uh, your cottons. Uh, sometimes if you've got like a short rambouillet or a really short merino that's only like two inches long, you might want to do that. Uh, and then on the other end of the spectrum, if you're doing art 
bats or art yarn where you really want to throw half a kitchen sink in there, you're going to want to open this up as much as you can because on a art bat, you don't necessarily want to card the fiber, right? You want to just smush it all together. So you want to create less friction so that there's less cardinating action. So you're going to open this gap up and let as many things pass through as possible. Okay. And as far as adjusting the distance between the two drums, uh, that is something we can do on our elites on the convert. I'm sorry, on the standard series, those come set at the factory. And on those ones, we, uh, drill right down into the bearing and those are pinned. So that's not something that's changeable, but on the elite series, that is something that you can change. Like say, I want to do cotton right now. And my next bat, I want to do an art bat. And the next bat after that, I want to do just some regular three inch long wool. Totally doable. It's really simple. And, um, no, I don't have the tools at hand to do that, and we probably don't have the time to show that right now, uh, but it's certainly something that I could make a video on later. So if that's something you want to see, let me know. Uh, a couple more questions here, and then I promise we're going to do it. Uh, <laughs> should we ever, uh, let's see, that was that one. Uh, can you add the deflectors to a standard carter? Uh, Linda, no, we can't. That's one of those things where the standard series is, you know, our economy line, so it doesn't have the um, fiber deflectors. It doesn't have the removable or adjustable handle. Uh, it, you can't adjust the distance between the drums. And again, it's just if, if I built all that into that, well, then that's our Elite Series. So if you want all of those features, that's what the Elite Series is designed for. Okay. And everybody give me one second. I'm going to admit, I just realized that there were about 14 people in the waiting room. So welcome to everybody who is in the waiting room. My apologies for not getting you all in sooner. Okay. So let's just make sure we got everybody in. All right. Perfect. Okay. So welcome to everybody who's in. I'm sorry. I, I was keeping an eye on the chat and didn't have my eye on the waiting room. So welcome to everybody who just joined us. We were just talking about what different parts of the carters are and uh, the distance between the two drums and things like that. Uh, so I'm not gonna go back over those, but that is all, it'll all be available on the recording. Uh, and then the last question here before we get started was from Sarah, who says, you can do cotton on a drum carter? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, Sarah, it's totally doable. Again, like I said, you're going to want to adjust the gap between the two drums to be as narrow as possible. Uh, so adjust that until those teeth go tick, 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 and then back it up just a little bit. And then you can work with cotton on that. And, and there is a little trick there as far as when you're working with something like that, you're going to let the liquor in load up. Okay. So you're going to see all this fiber just go onto there and it's going to start to fill it up. And once the fiber that you're working with, whether it's cotton or whatever, it could be Angora. This is a great way to use Angora Bunny too. Um, once the liquor in is full, it will then start to card onto the Swift. Okay, so yeah, you can absolutely do cotton, uh, Angora. Like I said, a lot of those short, slippery fibers are, are great to do on there. So without further ado, I think that was all of our kind of introductory questions. And uh, looks like everybody is in now. So welcome, let's get started. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, we want to be able to see through this fiber cloud. Okay, And I should say everything that I'm going to do here today is the exact same way that I would do it on a hand crank drum carter, with the exception that I'm not hand cranking. Okay, The uh, speed at which this carter runs uh, is about 90 RPM. And we did some experiments when we first came out with this and we said, okay, uh, how fast can you hand crank? Because we wanted to make it just about as fast as you could hand crank. So everything that I'm doing here uh, is gonna be done at the same speed that you could crank by hand, okay? So same kind of things. All right, and what I'm doing here is I am just taking these over lock by lock and I am popping them open on my lock pop, which you can see here. And the lock pop, the best way to think about it is an inverted flicker. And you can see by 
by doing that, I just open it up and I get this nice lofty cloud that I can feed right into the drum part. Okay. And I see a couple questions coming in here, so let me go ahead and answer those. Uh, is the fiber on the liquor in waste? Uh, now, it, it depends there, Eve, uh, exactly what you're talking about. If, if we're talking about what, I, what we have just mentioned about carding cotton or angora, that fiber on the liquor in, in that case, uh, no, that's going to be good fiber. Uh, you're, you can find another use for it. it. It just won't be a part of your bat. Okay. Uh, now, if it is uh, anything else, right? Like if it's not something where you've intentionally let the, the liquor in load up, yeah, you can call that car, uh, carding waste if you want. Um, a lot of the time, it's going to be your shorts and your second cuts, your noils, things like that. So if you're into felting, that's a good place to pick up, you know, some project fiber there. Um, but yeah, other than that, it, it is going to be waste, especially if you are doing what I'm doing over here, which is running this through a lock pop first and then feeding it into the carter. Uh, you know, we're not going to have a whole lot of waste ending up on our liquor. Okay. And again, you can see what I'm feeding in here. It's just a little cloud, right? It's really light, fluffy, lofty. You can see right through it. And I will mention a couple of things here. I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of pointers that will solve just about every issue that we have ever come across as far as operator error. There are two things here. And one is I already addressed, don't feed too much fiber in, right? See how I can see that? I can't see the fiber cloud. I'm sorry. I can't see through this fiber cloud, right? I can't see my red line. And over here I can. That is going to be a huge problem solver for you uh, in that feed less fiber into the carter at one time. The second thing is don't hold back on your fiber. If I put this in and I sit here and I hold back on it, I'm going to, and it usually makes a liar out of me. There we go. See how that wrapped right around and it's, of course, it's a really light brown color. But see how you can see this now? It's going to come around here. See how there's just that little bit? By holding back, you're not letting the fiber feed on through into the swift. Okay, so it's not getting carded. It's being held back and just wrapping around the liquor. In. So those two things there are going to make a day and night difference in your carding. I guarantee you. Uh, I would say probably 90 or 95% of the issues that we hear from people can be solved by just taking care of that. Okay. Uh, okay, and Sarah says, so do the liquor in and swift get close enough to hear the tick tick or just very close? Well, you should not operate it when you hear the teeth touching. Okay, you always, uh, on any drum carter other than uh, Louette. Louette is designed that way, it's an interference carter. Uh, I, I won't get into that today, but just take my word for it. Uh, any card or other than the Louette, if you hear the teeth touching, you should stop and make an adjustment because otherwise you are going to wear the carding cloth out and you'll have to replace it shortly. Uh, so you don't want to run it with the teeth going tick, 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 Sarah. You, when you're adjusting it, uh, you always want to uh, mind that gap and then roll the drums a little bit and see if you can hear it. And... Uh, Adjust it so that you can hear it and then back it off just a little bit so you can no longer hear it. And that, that way you'll know you have it as close as you can. Okay, uh, Marilyn says, interested in hearing if the method or speed of carding is different for fine fleece or medium grade. Uh, absolutely not, Marilyn. Um, that's a, a great question and, and one thing that we hear a lot, I, I did a a blog post a while back called uh, Fleece, what is it, Three three Myths About fine, Carding Fine Fleece? Yeah, Carding Fine fine Fleece, easy for me to say. Uh, something along those lines. 
and uh, that was one of the things that we talked about. And where that comes from is in a mill operation, the mill will slow down their entire operation. And we're talking about several hundred RPM compared to what we're working with here, right? Which is less than a hundred. Uh, they will uh, slow down their entire operation so as to avoid static electricity. Uh, but here on a drum carter, whether you're talking about electric or whether you're talking about hand crank, you're not gonna make any distinction as far as crank speed or anything like that uh, between what you're doing as far as a medium or a, a long wool or a coarse wool, anything like that. Okay, how do you clean the liquor in? Fran, I will get to that. Uh, as soon as we get a bat off of here, I'll talk about the cleaning brush and, and how we clean that off. Uh, how many ounces of fiber does the, Barbara, I'm assuming you mean our standard uh, carter. Uh, those, it, typically two to two and a half ounces is kind of the max for the eight inch wide, eight inch wide and about one is gonna be the max on the four inch mini standard. Um, and Allison says, what do you do to manage static? Great question, Allison. I know you are up there in Colorado in those high uh, mountain plateaus where it's nice and dry and you have uh, lots of static issues, especially with uh, alpaca and things like that. If you're having static issues, uh, one thing you can do is take the fiber that you're gonna work with, uh, toss it in a little plastic bag, take a squirt bottle and just a couple spritzes of water, seal that bag up, let the wool soak up or alpaca, whatever fiber it is, let it soak up that moisture uh, and then try processing it the next day. Uh, <laughs> a little anecdote, we had a, a customer call in and she was in Wyoming and she said, my carter broke, it used to work fine, but it broke, it's, it's not working now. And we got to the, the heart of the problem was the fact that it had been over 100 degrees with like low 20% humidity for over a week straight. And she, you know, the static was through the roof and, and everything was sticking to everything and she just couldn't cart. So she tried that method I just talked about, uh, squirting some uh, water in the bag and solved the problem overnight. So, uh, you know, that's one way to fix a quote unquote broken carter right there, <laughs> okay? Uh, the reason that I, I stopped here is I want to talk about our first tool that's going to help us uh, other than the, the lock pop. And you'll see me use the lock pop over here a lot. And I, I can talk about it just a little bit more uh, when I get on to maybe the next bat. But the first thing I want to talk about is a tool that we're going to use while we're carting. This is called our packing brush. Uh, packing is, is uh, something that I feel is very important on a bat for a couple of reasons. One, it keeps the bat together. When you peel the bat off, it's going to keep it together uh, as far as you're not going to leave part of the bat behind, right? You're more likely to remove the whole part of the bat. And especially today where we're talking about getting the most out of your card or being most efficient. Well, if you're going to leave half your bat behind, what have you really gained, right? So uh, we like to keep the whole bat together that way. And then also uh, kind of back to Allison's point where we're talking about um, static and things like that. I think that this nylon bristle brush helps dissipate a little bit of the static, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and start the carter up and you'll see how I use this. And that's it, we're just looking for one or two revolutions and I'm gonna do that, what I like to say, it's like voting in Chicago, early and often, right? Uh, if you, only do this at the end of the bat, then you're gonna have a, a fluffy bat on the bottom and nice and compressed on the top. So if you wanna make a nice even bat, uh, pack early and often. One thing I like to do is to weigh out the entirety of my bat. So let's say we have a one ounce bat and then maybe separate it out into four or five different equal amounts. So you might have you know, a quarter of an ounce in four different batches, then feed a quarter of an ounce and then pack. And then feed another quarter of an ounce and then pack. And that way you'll have a consistently packed bat, it's going to stay together when you're taking it off of there. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to feed a little bit more and we'll talk about our next uh, tool, which is, let me grab some more fiber. Our next tool is, is kind of similar to the packing brush, and, but it's a little bit different in that it has steel teeth instead of nylon bristles. And I'm going to move this out of the way so I have some more working space. 
uh, this table, somebody asked me yesterday about what, what kind of operation, uh, operating table I like to use. And I like something with a little bit more working room than this. Uh, it's a little small. It's a good size for, for demoing in that. Uh, but it's a little small for this. So if, if you are looking for uh, advice on what to use, something a little bit wider. I like at least four to six feet on my workspace. That way you can really spread out. You can lay your bat out and not have any issues that way. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the burnishing brush. This is the next tool that we're going to use. Um, and I think one thing that I forgot to mention, let me just back up for a second. The packing brush over here, this will pack a 30% thicker bat. Okay. The burnishing brush here, this will pack a 50% thicker bat. Okay. It has metal bristle, bristles, kind of like on a hand card, except as you can see, these are all straight, right? There's no bend in these teeth. So uh, it's going to have a lot more force as far as compared to the nylon bristles of the packing brush. And for those of you uh, just tuning in, uh, the code word of the day is bat lifter. Okay. And if you are on uh, Facebook watching us live on, on Facebook, welcome. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure we're going to have a couple people writing that code word in the comments, and that's great. I, I appreciate your enthusiasm. Uh, the way that this uh, contest is going to work is that we're going to have you enter those in a form on Saturday. Okay, so write that code word down, hold it until Saturday, and then on Saturday you'll head to clemens.com slash summer camp, and we'll have you enter those code words. And for each day that you have a code word, you're entered to win a, the prize for that day. And if you have four of the eight code words, four or more of the eight code words, meaning you, you tuned in at least long enough to get to the code word on four different days, uh, then you'll be eligible for the grand prize, which again is a one year subscription to the Good Clean Fiber Club of your choice. Okay, so I am feeding a little bit of fiber on here. And again, I'm just opening these tips up with my lock pop. And now I will go ahead and use this bat lifter, or I'm sorry, burnishing brush. Got bat lifter on my brains because that's the code word. We're gonna use this and it, it's very similar to uh, the packing brush and that we're just gonna do a couple of revolutions, lift it, a couple of revolutions, and that's it. Again, that's something we're gonna do early and often. Uh, we want to pack a, a thick and consistent bat. We want the bat to stay together when we take it off the carter, okay? Now, I, like I said earlier when I was talking about the packing brush, for consistency's sake, I like to weigh the amount of fiber that I'm working with. Um, I didn't do that here. I'm just kind of shooting from the hip. Uh, you can see that I haven't fed very well or very evenly and I don't have a very big bat yet. So I'm going to keep working while I'm talking. I'm happy to take uh, any questions that anybody has at this point uh, about either the uh, bat lifter, I'm sorry, the burnishing brush or the packing brush. And uh, I do have a couple of other things I want to maybe say about both of those. Uh, when it comes to using the Diz or the um, making Rolags, okay? You want to pack with the packing brush. Okay, let's say that again. When it comes to using a Diz or making Rolags, you want to pack with a packing brush. And the reason is when you pack with the burnishing brush, you actually get uh, it, it does too good of a job, right? Like it packs the fiber too well. And you want to not have the fiber quite as densely packed because you want those fibers to slip a little bit because of the way that we're going to remove it, right? So uh, something to think about there is what is your end goal going to be? Now, if you had a project where, say, you were going to do Let's just say three ounces and, and 
three ounces is fairly comfortable for most fibers. You can get that all in, in one bat here on one of our Elite Series Carters. And your very first, maybe your first one or two passes, you were gonna do all three ounces at once. You could pack those with your burnishing brush because you're, you're trying to get a large amount onto the carter at one time. But from there, you might only do one ounce at a time or even less if you're going to use um, a Diz, right? Depending upon what size Diz you use, our, our Diz pack goes all the way down to 10 grams. So you might be using a very small amount. And when you do that, you're going to want to pack with a packing brush, right? So usually on the same bat, within the same bat, you'll use the same brush, but not necessarily always within the same project. And then something else to, to kind of consider is when you're using, when you're carding fine fiber, something down in the, in the teens in the micron range, I, I'd almost always recommend going with the packing brush. And that's just because the burnishing brush, again, with the steel teeth, it can be a little harsh uh, and you can start to tear fibers. And, and uh, typically when you have a finer fleece, it's gonna be more expensive. And so uh, we don't wanna tear that expensive fiber that you paid for. So question coming in, oh, okay. So Fran said, do you alternate the brushes? Fran, I think I got that covered. Uh, the only reason here that I, I did use both of them in the same bat is for demonstration purposes, right? So Fran asked, do you use both brushes within the same bat? And it, it's really no, like I said, one kind of one bat, one brush, but maybe within a project, you're going to uh, use different, different brushes at different times for different reasons, depending upon the fiber that you use. Okay, I've got uh, another question here. Beth says, is it okay to ask questions about non clemens drum card? Beth, you're, you're free to ask the question. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that you're gonna like the response. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, go for it, Beth, and uh, I, I will answer as honestly as I can. Okay, so if you have a question about non clemens and clemens Carter, uh, I'm happy. Uh, many of you know we, we did actually uh, carry a couple of different brands. We used to carry the uh, Fricky. This was back in the early 1970s, actually about a decade before I was born. So we did carry um, the Fricky and the, the Meyer Carters uh, before we started making our own and, and uh, carrying them as part of the reason that uh, we came up with our own design. Uh, but I am familiar with, with just about everything that's out there. I have used everything uh, out there and I, I kind of know a little bit about everybody's capabilities. So uh, any question you've got, Beth, I'm happy to, happy to do my voice. Um, and the next question here, Sarah says, would you use one over the other, pack of risk Now, I think I kind of got that there, uh, Sarah. Uh, kind of a general rule of thumb is the, the longer a fiber is, the longer and coarser it is, the more likely I am to use the burnishing brush, right? And if it's something that's on the finer side, the more likely that I would be to use the packing brush. And then again, it's just going to depend on what your end product is. If your end product is a bat, you could definitely go either way. And if your end product is going to be Rolex or if you're going to diz it off, then that's something where you definitely need to think about the packing brush instead of the burnishing brush. All right, if there's any other questions here about packing or burnishing brushes, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, I think we're starting to get a, no, it's not that big of a bat, but it, it's okay size. It's probably maybe half an ounce. So that's still pretty much a baby bat, but we can talk about it there. Um, one thing I, I should probably mention talking about packing brushes. You'll see a lot of these where they are mounted. Um, and what you'll see is there's kind of like an overhead bar here that goes across and permanently mounts. And what you'll see, and, and this is kind of easy for me to show with the overhead, is that it's going to lay down like this, okay? And you see how this is kind of sitting flat? And when you see when I use it, I'm perpendicular, okay? So I'm getting down into the teeth, right? So I'm, I'm really packing it down. That's achieving what I want to achieve which is packing a thick bat, 
right? It's really about efficiency. So we really want to make sure that, that we're getting this fiber packed in there. So if it's just kind of passively laying on top, you aren't getting a lot of packing action from that, okay? Um, the other thing about a permanently mounted brush is if it's here the whole time, and, and you'll see this, usually they're kind of like on the back side, and then you can flip them up out of the way. Well, anytime you go to remove the bat, anytime you go to use uh, the bat lifter or use a cleaning brush or anything like that, they're, all, they're always in the way, okay? You either gotta reach, up, reach over, work around them, something like that. So uh, that's the one thing I'll say. A lot, a lot of brushes have, perm I'm sorry, a lot of carters have permanently mounted brushes, and I'm not a fan because I think they're ineffective, and I think they actually hold you back as far as being in the way. So that's a common question we do get about those. And I saw a few questions come in. So let me pop a look at those before uh, we go ahead and remove this with the dopper. Um, blah, 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 blah. Uh, do you use a picker prior to running your faces through the carter? Uh, I do not, thank you, Barbara. I do not use a picker. Uh, I do use the lock pop if it's something like this. Now, this fleece is, is nice and open and I can, I can open these, you know, so I, so I have one individual lock and I could feed these locks individually in. Again, I'm just trying to be more efficient. If I'm popping this open on the lock pop, I can probably save myself one and sometimes two passes through the drum carter. So that's why I would do that. I don't like pickers. Uh, they all seem kind of like medieval torture devices. Uh, so from a safety standpoint, I don't like them. And from a fiber standpoint, I, I don't like them because I have yet to find one that uh, doesn't tear fiber, right? Or doesn't get so mucked up with fiber that, uh, you know, you have to stop and clean it every two minutes. So I haven't found one that's designed properly. They're, they're great in an industrial setting, but there has yet to be a good design for one that's uh, functional, I would say, from terms of efficiency and safety on a home or even cottage industries. So that, that's my thought on pickers. Okay. Next question here. Uh, Rosemary says, I'm new and confused about TPI. When would you use which number? If you can only get one, which one would you get? If you buy your carters, can you swap out one for the, the other? Okay. Uh, Rosemary, happy to answer that question. Everything we do is 72 teeth per inch, and it's a mill-style sharpened cloth. Uh, that's unlike anything else that you're going to find out there. And what we found with that mill-style sharpened cloth, and what we mean by that is that the teeth are sharpened to a point, each individual teeth. So there's thousands of teeth on here. Each one is ground to a point. Those uh, essentially split hairs, right? Like if you think about what's happening, and I can just do a brief demo here with this one lock. All right, and I'll turn this key off and see if you can see, okay, you can see it's coming up right here. So every one of these little individual strands coming up through here, it's coming up to a teeth and it can either go to the left of that tooth or the right of that tooth, right? And there's thousands of these teeth and and as this goes under power, thousands and thousands of teeth are going across the end of each one of these. And so when these fibers come in and they see the sharpened tooth, it's kind of like a knife and they can either go to the left or to the right. So with anybody else's carter, what you're going to find is that instead of a sharpened tooth, they're just clipped. They're cut square. Okay? And that creates a flat spot on top. And so instead of all these little teeth with all these little decisions of either left or either right, there's a third decision, a third possibility that can happen, and that these fibers coming up through here could actually sit on top. And that's how we get neps and noils, and that's where you get a lot of the issues as far as carding different fibers of, of different microns and different lengths and things, things like that. So with the cloth that we have, the 72 TPI is going to function better than these 144 or 180 or 290 kind of joke numbers that you see out there. Um, as far as it's going to process better because um, the fiber doesn't have that additional choice of sitting on top and creating a noil, the fiber is either going to go left or it's going to go right. And so when you're working with your finer fibers, 
you don't have to have a whole bunch of, of different drums or a whole bunch of different carters. Uh, we build just one uh, two TPI, right? Just our 72 TPI. Uh, and we have it designed right. It's a very expensive cloth to have it ground. That's why nobody else does it. That's why our carters are on the higher end of the price point. Uh, but they're that way because it's worth it. You don't have to spend extra money on extra drums. You don't have to buy three different drum carters for your coarse, medium, and fine. This one's gonna do everything you want. Like I talked about earlier, if you wanna do cotton, you can. If you wanna do uh, art bat, you can. You can do it all on the same machine and you can do it by just making the adjustments. You don't have to uh, swap out drums or anything else like that. And let me see what other questions we've got here. Fran says, when you say diz it off, are you pulling the fiber off the Swiss Swift using the diz? Yes, that is exactly what I'm talking about, Fran. I am talking about removing what we would call carded sliver. That's going to be, uh, it's a rope-like preparation, right? Just like um, any kind of roving, but we call it carded sliver because that's a very descriptive term that tells you that it has been through a drum carter, but it has not been combed. So that's why we use the term carded sliver. But yes, when I say diz, that's what we're talking about. Uh, Chris says, when you open the locks, there's fiber left behind. Is that waste or will you feed that in eventually? Okay, Chris. So uh, I am getting a little bit of fiber here. And one thing I would do, this all looks like pretty good fiber, although I can see some second cuts in it, right? But there are some good fibers here. And the first thing I'm going to do is, is test it. I want to make sure that it's, it's not weak, right? Um, and I, I don't know why it was left behind, right? Some of it though is kind of short, some of it is long, but some of it is tender. And for me, if I'm doing a project, if I wanna make a, a sweater, right? If I'm gonna take all the time to make a sweater or even a pair of socks, right? I mean, socks don't make themselves overnight. The sock gnomes don't just show up and finish all your carding and your, and your spinning and your knitting. If, if I'm gonna take the time to go through all that work and make a project. Anything that's left behind on here, yeah, I'm probably not gonna feed it into the drum carter. Same thing with the liquor in. The liquor in is kind of your filter, right? So think of this as filter one. This is really becoming filter two. Uh, anything like that, I'm not going to turn around. Uh, like think about your filter on uh, your home furnace or your air conditioner, right? If you have your filter, do you turn around and knock all that stuff into the duct? No, you, you take it outside and clean the filter, or dispose of it or whatever. Uh, so I don't wanna reintroduce that back into the system, right? So I'm gonna let that go. Uh, I can see what's on here a little bit. Some of this is, is shorts, weak, tender, second cuts, things like that. And that stuff, I'm just not gonna worry about. If you're a felter, this is, is great for that. Uh, if you've got a uh, couple of birds right outside your window, uh, you know, leave this there for them and they'll make a nice nest out of it. They love it for that. But I've got a, a trash can that I keep right here next to me. You can see it's got, got my, how can I, there we go. Okay, there you go. You can kind of see, tough to see. But you can see I've got everything that I've tossed out over the last couple of days, uh, some vegetable matter, other things like that. I keep that right alongside me, okay? And I just toss that into there and I don't worry about it because if I want a pair of socks that's gonna last me for five or 10 years, what do I care if I have an extra 10% of waste, right? So start out with a little bit more than you think you need for your project and uh, don't short yourself, right? You're going to spend all this time making this. And then if it's, you know, let's say it's a nice sweater. The, the first, second time you wash it, it's pilling because you said, oh, well, I don't want to have any fiber go to waste. Well, now you wasted the entire sweater and all your time, right? So I, for me, it doesn't make any sense to throw that stuff back in there. That's my, my own personal opinion. Uh, okay, other questions here. Carolyn says, if you wanna put your fiber through multiple passes through the carter, what suggestions do you have for handling the fiber, splitting the bat, thinning out the fiber? Carolyn, excellent question. And uh, it's probably just about time for me to get onto that. Uh, like I said, I've got a small enough bat that we can go ahead and start that. So absolutely, uh, we can talk about that. Uh, and Beth has a question. She says, I'm not sure if it's actually specific to drum carters. I have a Scrouch Finest double wide. Sorry to hear that, Beth. I tend to load the input tray with locks, and no matter how I see through, I 
no matter how, oh, no matter how see-through, okay, so you're talking about how thin the cloud is, no matter how thin it is, um, it tends to kind of wrinkle and make double layers at the end of the batch. You never say to, you say to never hold the fiber back, but that's the only thing that keeps fiber loading evenly. Any suggestions? So yes, that, like I said, when, when you first said that, can I ask a question about a different brand? So the liquor in on the Strouch is completely different from the liquor in that we use that just about everybody else uses. That liquor in is designed for an industrial machine. Okay, so if you have this great big machine that's 36 inches long, you need some way to get the fiber, once it's gone through an industrial picker, fed down a conveyor belt and into the carter. And that's what that liquor in is designed for. That slicker liquor in style is really not designed for a drum carter like this. What you need for a home drum carter that just has two drums is you need a similar style of carding cloth because one drum, the liquor in, needs to hold the fiber back while the swift, the large drum here, pulls that fiber away from it. And it's, it's the interaction, the friction between those two drums that actually creates the carding. And when you have that liquor in style of liquor, I think Fricky uses it as well, um, you kind of have to trick it into getting the fiber to feed. And then every time you pull a bat off of there, if you hold it up, you're gonna be able to see every individual lock or strand of fiber that you've put in because there isn't a whole lot of carding action. There's no friction. There's no hold back on the liquor in like there should be. Uh, you will see that is one of those cases where the mounted brush actually helps out because that, that brush that's over the top and kind of holds down, that is actually doing the carding action, right? Once it's gone through, uh, that is kind of acting like the, the only little thing on that carter that's, that's doing any carding action is that mounted brush. So I would say definitely that mounted brush in place and you're gonna have to do multiple passes to get something that resembles a carded bat. Uh, so that's, that's kind of my answer there. Working, working with something like that, is, it's just gonna be completely different than working from something that is designed with carding cloth. And uh, yeah, sorry, I, I don't know what else to tell you. I wish I had better news. <laughs> Okay, uh, Eve said you're using fleece. How would you advise those using commercial comb top or add-ins such as silk and oil? Eve, that's a, a great question, and I'm going to try to remember to get to that when uh, I go to feeding uh, back in on the second pass. Okay, so that'll be very similar in that one. Marilyn says, how many passes do you do in making a bat? Can you talk about blending different fibers or colors? Uh, again, let's try to get to that one uh, when we talk about the second bat, once I peel, peel it off and, and run it back through. Uh, and if I don't, uh, just send me a reminder in the chats if I don't get to that's That's three things there I kind of want to talk about on the second pass. And Sarah Busey says, my older Carter, uh, I could put a finer tooth drum on and it just made the nips worse. My premise. Carter is wonderful comparatively. Thank you for that. Uh, and uh, Fran says our Carters are really uh, worth it. Thank you for that. Uh, Sam says she pops commercial locked top onto the lock top and then run it through the Carter and gets a much better bat. Yeah, I, I would agree, Sam. That's a great way to do that. And uh, Beth, uh, we were just talking about that Strouch. She says, thanks for the response. I'll stop feeling guilty about holding the fiber back. Yeah, that's one of those things, Beth, I'm sorry, you know, it's not operator error, it's it's really drum carter design error, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but you, you know, today hopefully I can give you the information that you need to get the most out of the drum carter that you have, okay? And like you said, stop feeling guilty, it's not your fault. You can totally blame it on the carter. Uh, Barbara says, I thought when you use the Diz, it was right off the drum. I don't understand the part about using the Swift. Yeah, so Barbara, this, this drum right here, this is the Swift, okay? We don't mean a yarn Swift. We're talking about this drum, the large drum, is a Swift. So we're gonna take the fiber right off of here uh, when, we, when we do get to the Diz. And that's my hope today is, we got 25 minutes left here, we can probably still do that. Um, can you give me a, could you give me a, um, a scale so I can get an ounce? Yeah, thank you, sir. 
and same we were talking about the uh, lock pop there she says it also means I'm not using my hands to pull the comb top apart and that's big uh, I know especially sand uh, if you've got hand issues or whatever um, yeah that's that's a big deal so um, not having to pull the top apart with your hands is a big deal so okay I'm gonna go ahead and pop this off of here okay so we can keep going and so this is our stainless steel offer okay I'm gonna separate the whole bat I want to take every single uh, fiber off of here I don't want to leave any uh, strands behind yeah you can just set it down yeah I don't want to leave any strands behind okay I want to make sure we've got this all out of here okay now how do we get it off of here if you've done this before if you've seen somebody else do this a lot of people just take this little bit of troll hair and they just peel it on off of here we've got a tool we call it the bat lifter i've got it somewhere around here and the bat lifter is, is designed to not only remove but store your whole bat and so it's got two wooden pieces here okay and it's got a little bit of Wednesday bill from yesterday's class, apparently. Okay, and this little sheet here, this is an anti-static sheet, okay? And it has a pocket in one end, okay? And we're gonna put one of these pieces in there. Then we're gonna put this over the top, and we're gonna put this one right here. We're gonna clamp those tips right together, okay? There's rubber bands here and here. We're gonna clamp those together. Then we're gonna roll over the top and away from us. And you can see, we're gonna take 100% of the bat off. Okay. And even some of yesterday's Wednesday bale, it looks like. <laughs> A little bit that got left behind. Okay. Now, if you wanted to store this, this is a pretty small bat, but if you wanted to store this, it comes with a clear storage tube. Okay, you can back spin this, pop these bands off, slide them out. And if, if you wanted to, you can slide a little label in here so you, you know exactly what it is, just a little piece of paper. Uh, you can also write on them with a, a Sharpie or a, a magic marker, anything like that, so you know exactly what's in them. And uh, you can store these for as long as you want. Uh, my wife, uh, when we first started dating, I think, which is, oh boy, was that 2015, babe? Uh, my wife did some Coradale and uh, she did a whole fleece and she's got them sitting in a box that's about the size of this drum carter and when she's ready to spin she just goes over pulls one out and gives this little twist and there we have our bat okay so it goes just like that fluffs right back up and it's ready to spin or card again whatever our, our next step in the process is okay so i'm going to take this off of here Whoop. Get this out of the way. Uh, Eve says, would a hand carter or a flicker be a good alternative to a lock pop? Uh, yes, a, a flicker is uh, kind of the direct comparison, Eve, to a lock pop. The big difference is with a hand carter or a flicker, you have to hold the weight of that tool in your hand, and then you're trying to hold the lock steady while you're flicking it. Whereas with the lock pop, this is stationary. It's clamped to the edge of the table. I know you can't see it, but there's a clamp right here holding it in place. And all you have to hold is the weight of one little lock and you pop it, turn it around, pop it, and you're done. It's very quick. It's stationary. It's one of those things. You don't have to do it right in front of the drum carter. I'm doing it today for demo purposes, but you don't have to do it right in front of the drum carter. Uh, you could, if you wanted to, sit at your bench you know somewhere that's comfortable where you're not standing and your back's aching uh you could pop you know a few ounces which is enough for one bat or you could pop a whole entire fleece and and then go ahead and card your bat uh, so there's lots of options there i'm going to step aside just for a second i want to weigh this out let's see how much this fluffy cloud is okay 0.46 so we're a little light there um Typically, I, I'd like to show the diz, and typically what I would do is I'd like a one ounce diz because that's really what I like to demonstrate the best, but I do have this handy tool here, which is 
our Diz Pack, okay? And the Diz Pack comes with seven different size Dizzes. And if I read this, because I don't remember off the top of my head, but if I read this, it'll tell me that the yellow one is for about a half ounce, okay? So that's the one we're gonna pull out. That's the size sliver that we're gonna make here. Okay. Okay, and since I'm going to pull this off with uh, Diz, I'm going to set my burnishing brush aside. I only want to use uh, the packing brush. And probably before I do this, we should talk about the cleaning brush, right? Now's a good time to talk about the cleaning brush. And the way we use the cleaning brush, the handle is always going to go towards the back of the carter when we do this. And we're going to start with the liquor in. The reason we're going to start with the liquor in is that if we started with the Swift, we got the Swift all nice and clean. Then when we went to the liquor in, some of that is going to transfer from the liquor in back onto the Swift, and we've got to do it all over again. Okay, so let's start with the liquor in. And this is an electric carter, but that doesn't mean that uh, you have to turn the, the power on or have it rotate slowly. You definitely don't ever want to clean with the cleaning brush under power. Okay, bad idea. So we can put our hand on the Swift, or we can put our hand over here on the pulley. And I, I will say that's just for ours. Uh, it's gonna be different for every individual make and model of Carter, okay? But for the Clemens and Clemens electric Carters, uh, you can always just turn the Swift or turn the motor, or turn the pulley that's on the Swift, okay? Either way. And so what I'm doing here to clean is just short strokes. And I'm going back and forth all the way across. All right, and then, like we talked about earlier, was it, was it Chris that asked me a question about what do you do with that little bit of waste? Well, you can see there's not much here because this is, the way I described it is this is really my second filter if I'm using the lock pop, right? So there's not a whole lot here. There's a, a big, thick second cut right there, and there's a little bit here as well. Other than that, most of this is just really short seconds, or maybe tender bits of the fleece, okay? So that that's definitely, what do you wanna call it, carding waste or uh, your next felting project, whatever it is, right? And so then I'm gonna go back to the Swift. And again, just short strokes, back and forth, all the way around the carter. And that's it. There wasn't much on there, just a little bit that transferred off while I was cleaning. So not much. And again, you know, if you want to save that little bit for another project, that's totally fine. All right. So let me just pop onto here and look for a couple of questions. Rosemary says, what would be the advantages of the different widths? Rosemary, I'm assuming you're talking about drum carters. Uh, the bigger and wider the drum carter is, the more you can put on it. That's really the biggest advantage. Uh, the double wide crank list that we have is about an eight ounce carter. So if you want to do, you know, your whole project out of one bat, if it's a, you know, a couple pairs of socks, you could definitely do that. Uh, if you want to do a sweater and you want to get out all out of, you know, maybe four or five bats, then hey, there you go. Uh, Lois Gier says, even using a bat lifter, I seem to have fiber that remains on the Swift. Any tips to minimize that? Uh, Lois, my question would be, what's the fiber length that you're using? Uh, if it's something that's really short, it might be leaving your fiber behind. And then sometimes when I see that as well, it's because the fiber's tender, right? Like it'll be leaving fiber behind that's tender. And then if it's neither of those things, one thing I would definitely make sure is that your doffing strip Make sure you've got everything cleaned off of the docking strip. If you leave one strand behind here, because wool has scales, it's gonna grab the one next to it and next to it and next to it. And you'll tend to see, if you leave it behind, you'll tend to see this cascade kind of starting where there's one strand here and then there's half an inch here and then there's an inch here and half an inch wide. So you start to see this big strip that gets left behind on the carpet. So that's what I would recommend there, Lois. If you try those things and have any issues going forward, you let me know. Uh, Sand has a, a, some good advice here. She says she found that 0.3 to 0.5 ounce is a perfect size to diz off and not strain her hands. 
and she uses the green one for that. And I believe that's a little bit smaller than the one that I'm going to use. Uh, Ryoko, hello from Japan, or, or hello uh, to you coming in from Japan there. Uh, I have your neutral colored one. Okay, yep, that's the one ounce one. That's the one that comes with it. That's the standard size, Ryoko. You got it. Hello, halfway around the world there. Uh, Carolyn says, can you talk a bit about the standard versus the elite lines? Uh, yeah, the standard is, is our uh, introductory or uh, what do I want to say? Economy line, I guess, is probably the best way to put it. No frills, right? Doesn't have all the bells and whistles. The standards have, uh, they have our original drum cloth that we started with in the 70s. The Elite Series is taller, so they have higher capacity. Uh, our convertible has uh, about one and a half to two times of the capacity of the standard, even though they're both eight inches wide, right? Uh, we have the fiber deflectors. Uh, we have the, the bearing system that on the elites that allows you to uh, change the gap between the two drums. Uh, on the standards, you can't do that. Um, the Elite Series comes with all the tools. Uh, I should say it comes with six tools. Uh, comes with the doffer, cleaning brush, burnishing brush, packing brush, bat lifter, and the Diz. I think I got that all right. Uh, it's hard to keep track of them sometimes. Um, the uh, on the elites uh, the convertible comes with clamps uh, the crankless don't because they're heavy enough that they don't need them but on the uh, standard series they don't come with clamps again it's just more of our economy level the on the elites they're either all electric drive is in the crankless or our convertible is convertible to electric drive so you can start out with a hand crank and then get into the electric and Janica says, can any of the brushes be used interchangeably, such as flicker for cleaning? Yes, yeah, so Janica, the, the cleaning brush can be used as a flicker. It's just not as efficient. Uh, the flicker can be used for, cl for cleaning on the standard series, but it doesn't work on the Elite series because the Elite series has taller cloth, which is why we provide the cleaning brush with the Elite series. Okay. Um, just checking here, uh, one or two more questions here and then I've really got to get to uh, feeding this bat back through one more time so you guys can see that. And then hopefully a quick session on the divs before we have to end. Barbara Jones says, when in this process do you dye fiber prior to processing and after? And Barbara, that's really up to you. Uh, you can dye it in the fleece, right? You can dye it in the wool, dye it in the locks. Um, I think I, I really like the color when it comes out that way. Uh, or you can dye it once you get to uh, the yarn stage. Um, on a commercial level, the commercial fiber is so processed and, and you can make a nice thick uh, rope-like structure out of it that it won't come apart in the dyeing process. Uh, but for us, processing by hand, um, something like this, it's gonna be nice and lofty. It's gonna be fairly difficult to dye. Uh, you can definitely give it a shot, but Usually it's either going to be in the lock form or once it's in yarn. Okay. All right, so I'm going to get started here. We've got just a few minutes left. Uh, we're going to talk about how do we feed this back through. That was a question that came up. And then the, the other question that came along with that was, if this was processed fiber, how would you feed it? Okay. So it's funny. You can see how, how wide this is, right? I just pulled this off for the drum carter. You can see how much it's expanded already. Well, obviously, I can't just feed this right on back through. So the first thing that I'm going to do is split it in half. Stick that aside. And then I'm going to split it in half again. OK, and now you can see I've got something that is pretty see-through, right? Can we, uh, let's see, see if we can see through that, that red line. Kind of hard to see from there. but. Uh, you can actually see through this cloud that I've got. So as far as feeding it back through, once I've got it thin enough that I can actually see it, I'm then going to take off about one fiber length at a time. Now, if you remember how long my locks were, we were looking at that four to five inch length, right? So I'm gonna take off about one fiber length at a time and just drop one handful of fiber on my, my in-feed tray here. And that's what we're gonna feed right in. And again, I can feed right up against the fiber deflector. And we would do this the same as if it was fiber that had already been processed, right? Like if you were working with uh, 
a braid that you purchased or a commercial top or anything like that, we would do the same thing. Whether you have to strip it down or whatever it is, you need to get it thin enough so that you can see through your fiber cloud and then you want to feed one fiber length at a time. Okay? You'll see all kinds of videos where people might take this whole thing and feed it all the way in and that's going to give you issues as far as the fiber is not all going to feed in the same direction, right? Some of it's going to go in lengthwise, some of it's going to go in sideways. And you're just not going to have a, a very homogenous bat that's going to, to draft or spin well. And that's really the whole purpose of this, right? Uh, the reason that, that we're doing this by hand, other than the fact that we, we enjoy the process, is to make something that's really a, a dream to spin. So, Something to keep in mind. And you saw I'm using my packing brush here. And that's because we are going to take this off with the biz. And uh, like I said before, I, I like to pack early and often with the packing brush. So I, knowing that I'm gonna split this down into four pieces makes it kind of easy for me. So I can uh, pack after each of my four different parts. Right? Okay, and Sand says she uses the lock pop for her fiber separation. And the way you can do that, I'm assuming, is you're gonna take something like this, and if you put that on there, well now you have, eh, it's a little bit long, but I'm sure with, with a little bit of, of work at it, you can see that's a really easy way to find what one fiber length is, okay? And Diane, oh, good question, Diane. Diane says, I've watched people feed all their fiber in crossways rather than straight. Can you address the theory of this? Absolutely. So, Diane, there are two ways that you can prepare fiber with a drum program. One is semi-worsted, which is what we're doing. The other is woolen. And so what you're talking about is one of the two ways that you can create a woolen bat. Okay. So I'm feeding everything in lengthwise, and we can end up with either a bat, which is what we had the first time, or with carded sliver, okay, which is what we're going to end up with because I'm going to take this off as roving or uh, you know, through the diz, you create this rope-like structure. Okay, so that's the two styles of semi-worsted that we can create. And for woolen, you can do two things. You can either feed fiber in sideways, right? See how this fiber is going sideways. Right? So you could feed it in sideways and make a whole bath that was like that. Or you could feed it all in lengthwise, like this, and then instead of removing it as a bat, you could remove it around a dowel to create row lags. And you would create maybe six or eight row lags coming off of the carter at once. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna pack one last time here. And uh, I'm sorry, give me one second. What is that a question off Facebook? Uh, yes. Okay, so there's a question coming off Facebook. We're checking in on that too. And Anne says that she's, she's having an issue with fiber clogging up when she's feeding her carter. Uh, so Anne, you wanna be able to feed, you wanna be able to see through the cloud that you're feeding through your drum carter, feeding into your carter. We've got this red line here. You wanna be able to see through that uh, fiber cloud. You wanna be able to see that line, okay? Uh, old, old rule of thumb there was you want to be able to read a newspaper through whatever you're feeding it. I don't know if you can find a newspaper, but a book works as well. Uh, pull up a book on your iPad or something, and maybe you can see if you can read through that. And then the other thing there is also fiber length. You want to feed one fiber length at a time, okay? All right, so I fed this bat through a second time. Uh, considering that I ran it through my lock pop, uh, that kind of saved me one bat. So this is really going to be a nice preparation like you would typically expect to see off of maybe three passes or four passes rather than just two. And uh, so we're gonna go ahead and get started with the diz now. And so I have this diz, right? And so I've got a tapered side here and a flat side on the other. And what we're gonna do is we're going to, instead of peeling this off as a bat, we're going to spirally unwrap it. And uh, we are going to do that by, I'm gonna move to this side of the carter here. And rather than pulling up uh, the whole bat, I'm just going to pull up about half an inch here. And uh, if you're looking at this view, you're going to get part of my back. But hopefully you're looking at the top-down view, which is what I've spotlighted. Okay. So we're going to lift this up here. 
we're going to give it just a little bit of twist. And again, this is my tapered side that you can see the little funnel there. And there's my flat side. We're going to pull this through so that the tapered side goes down to the carter. Okay. And there we go. You can see pretty well what I'm doing. And we're going to pinch and pull. Okay. So we're going to pinch right here at the base of the disc. Let me rotate this so you can see. My hand is right there, right at the base of the disc. We're going to pinch and pull this out. And I'm going to pull it out less than one fiber length. So if you're thinking about what we were working with before, fiber length is four to five inches. So if I pull more than that, I'm going to start to pull this apart. Okay, so we don't want to pull more than that. And at the same time that I'm pulling with my right hand, and I'm right-handed, so I pull this way, uh, I'm going to hold the diz down on top of the drum with my left hand, and I'm going to slide the diz across the top of the teeth with my left hand. So this is a little pinch and pull method, and this one over here is holding the drum down. So we'll get started, okay? Pinch and pull, pinch and pull. I'll try to keep this hand back. I know it's hard to see on video, but I'm pinching and pulling, okay? Pinch and pull, and I might need to adjust what I'm doing here for the video demo. So I'm gonna work a little bit more up here. Pinch and pull. Pinch and pull. And typically I like to work in a, a quadrant. So I like to work between about maybe high noon and, and say if you're facing this way between high noon, and maybe uh, two thirty over here. Right. Uh, but while I'm demonstrating here, I need to be a little bit more vertical. Okay. And um, the reason that we don't want to work too far back here is that the fiber that we've pulled off is going to start to get caught down here and we don't want to be down here because then it will be too short. Right. So, we're gonna do that. And one other thing, as long as I'm stopped, one thing we need to think about is that I've got this gap right here. So where I'm at back here, I need to start shooting for the middle of this next strip, okay? So when I say that we're gonna spirally unwrap this, what I really mean is we're gonna go around one strip and then we'll go ahead and go around another strip and another strip, but we're gonna kind of jump over at each one of these junctions. And honestly, it looks like I'm a little thin and I started moving over too late already, but we'll see if we can salvage it. And that would just prove that I'm human. Right, so let's see, we're gonna to continue to pinch and pull. Ah, yeah, I didn't quite get it all. You can see there's some fiber leaving behind and you can see right there is where that gap was, okay? So we're just gonna keep going. We're not gonna worry about it. We're gonna leave a little bit of fiber behind. And this is gonna be a little bit smaller than we intended, but that's totally okay. And we're gonna slide over again, because we're right at our gap. And again, we're pinching and pulling, pinching and pulling, pinching and pulling. Okay. And this is sliding just like butter. And uh, it's really nice that some guy took all the time to figure out which size diz worked with which amount of fiber. So that when you said, well, I have a half ounce of fiber, what size of slide, slide uh, what size of dish should I use? It's really nice that the, some guy took all the time to work that out. And not only that, but it actually works out in practice too, not just in theory. So this is really convenient. And again, I'm pinching and pulling. Let me slow it down here for you. Pinching and pulling. My left hand is holding the disc down on top of the carter, as well as sliding it down along the teeth. Okay, and I see we're right at our time limit here. So I'm going to finish this off. And then I'm gonna take your last few questions and then we'll wrap it up here, okay? So that's the end of it. I'm going to wrap this up. Let me move around or I'll wrap it up so you can see me do it. Okay, and let's see. Questions that came in. Uh, I have one. Oh, let's see, next one. Uh, Rosemary says, What exactly is considered a pass? Rosemary, as far as John Carter, when, when we mean that, we mean taking all that fiber, whatever it is, whether it's you know this amount here, that would be one half an ounce feeding it through the drum carter and either creating a bat or creating a sliver, whatever it is, that's what we would call one pass through the drum carter, okay? 
Uh, San says, are you rotating the drum with your left hand, little finger on the carding cloth, or with pressure on the diz? Uh, you know what? Uh, that's a good question, San. I, I do it. Um, I do it without really thinking about it, but it's really my palm. Let me kind of assume the position here. And and the way that I'm doing it, get that little bit out of there, is that I'm kind of resting my palm here, and I rotate that really with my palm. Okay, so the diz is here. Uh, but I'm I'm rotating with my palm. It's kind of awkward here for me to get get in the right position because of uh, where the iPad is standing there. I can't get right to where I need to. But yeah, I I use my palm. I use that the the pad really of that left hand to rotate that around. Okay. Uh, other question here. I assume the di assume the diz numbers whoop, where they go are different for the double wide than the standard if they're by weight. Uh, yeah, you're correct. You you would just double the amount of fiber for the double wide. Uh, that's right, Beth. How do you how to make a rolly Guadalupe? We're gonna have to get that on another video. I'm sorry, we didn't squeeze it in on this one. Uh, we will get to it. Uh, Marilyn, you are welcome. Fran, you are welcome as well. Uh, glad everybody so far has enjoyed it. How do you suggest loading the tray if you're on a hand crank? Eve, good question. Same thing like I was doing before, one-handed. Uh, you can load the whole tray if you want and then hand crank a batch through, uh, or you can do it consistently if, if you've already popped all your fiber through the lock pop and you want to do that and then toss them all in, that's perfectly fine. It's entirely up to you. So, follow-up question for you. How do you art bag using that technique? How do you use an art pad? What technique? Art bed, the one you showed, it's separating. It's follow-up to her question of Jamie and Carter. Oh, uh, I don't know. I'll have to get to that one later. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and on Facebook there, you've got a question that came in. Uh, just go ahead and pop me an email if you could, and I'll have to try and get that one for you. Sorry about that, everybody. A little delay there. Okay, so uh, one couple of last things to wrap it up. Uh, code word for today is bat lifter. And let me do one thing here so you're not my paper. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so let's wrap it up here. Code word for today is bat lifter. Again, you'll enter those on Saturday on the form that we'll provide on the clemens.com slash summer camp page. Uh, the fleece that I was working with today, again, that was on, uh, that's all good clean fiber. And this particular one was this CVM Wednesday number 127. That's a really nice one. Um, I did mention all of our uh, deals already for uh, summer camp this week. And I hope you guys join us the rest of the week. Tomorrow we're talking with uh, J.C. Boggs Faulkner. Uh, that is at 11 a.m. Uh, Thursday at 1 p.m. We're going to be working specifically with Shave Them to Save Them Fleece. Uh, Friday, 11 a.m. Uh, that one, registration for that one is full up. That's with Judith McKenzie. And our last one, Saturday at 1 p.m., we're going to talk about broken, tender, and dirty fleece. So I hope you can join us for those. If not, uh, they will be available on the Summer Camp web page uh, later. Like I said, I've got the first two videos loaded uh, for now, so you can catch those. And uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for participating.